don't call it an experiment. That's really a misnomer because an experiment, you know, an experiment has controls. <laughs> this, this was classically out of control. <laughs>
I want to, I would like to do some travel this year. Mm. This, this month, I think this weekend actually marks one year uh, anniversary to the last time I traveled. The last time I traveled was to New York in February 2020 for the opening of uh, the U.S. opening of that movie, Reconnect, with uh, Brian Rose. So that was my last time I ventured out of the country. And now it's not even an option, you know. So anyway, how are you faring? <laughs> uh, not too bad. I mean, much like yourself, I'm not retired, but uh, my work hasn't changed much, you know, mm-hmm. pre-COVID compared to now which is a blessing in some senses, but at the same time, I'm beginning to really crave human interaction. And, <laughs> you know, I, I work online most of the time. Uh, right. So. Are you, are you alone? Are you, you have a, a wife or a family that you're living with? Well, I live with a housemate, but my family luckily is about, I would say 20 minutes away. So I still get to see them. Uh, okay. They were in a hot spot for, a brief moment. So there was, I think maybe a month where I couldn't see them, which was a bit tough. Uh, my grandma, yeah. obviously I couldn't really see for a long period, which I felt really bad about, but, um, Australia's handling it pretty well overall. Uh, we haven't okay. had too many cases and recently I, I don't think we've had many at all, if any. Um, so yeah, my, my wife is, uh, is tracking a lot of this in different countries and, um, you know, and it seems like Australia, New Zealand pretty much uh, have it under control for now, you know, so that's that's encouraging. Mm, I think it's helpful that we have a relative or well, a very large country and a very small population compared to it, which helps just in terms yeah. of social distancing, I would imagine. Um, right. The lockdowns, you obviously. Back, you able to get vaccines there? Uh, I'm not sure what the status is on the vaccines, honestly. Um, okay. like I'll wait until I find out, but I'm just kind of yeah. waiting around. I'm not, yeah, I'm not really yeah. sure what the situation is. I know the EU had some delays. Britain seems to be doing quite well with vaccines, but that's about all I know so far. EU had delays, and as a result of that, they basically threw Canada under the bus. Oh, really? Canada- Canada had ordered uh, something like 3 million doses or something and then recently got news that uh, they're not getting, they're getting maybe half that, you know, and who knows when the rest of it will come. But anyway, we didn't want to, you know, we didn't come here really to talk about that so much. Mm. (laughs) Well, one thing I will say on COVID or ask you is what do you think we the world looks like when we escape out of this? Do you think, you know, last time you're on the show, you mentioned that COVID in in a lot of ways has been a lesson for humans in that it shows us that we're not totally in control and that things can still happen to us and kind of veer us off of our course. What do you think a post COVID world looks like for humanity? Gosh, you know, I, I wish I had a crystal ball. I don't mm. know. I think, I think a few things. I think that, I think that uh, you know, potentially everybody's looking for, the, for when we get, when we beat COVID. But I don't think it's going to work that way. I, I think that, uh, you know, because of these mutants showing up and because of the you know, lack of access to vaccines in different countries and so on. I think it's going to be around for a long time. I, I don't think it's going to be like a, a pandemic where every time you go out the door, you have to mask up and, and observe all the protocols, you know. But I think that it's going to be, uh, it, it, it will be active in certain pockets. You know, there'll be countries that you would rather not go to that have it. That one of them, sadly, be in the United States. I mean, I wouldn't go to the States on a, but on a bet right now, you know, because it's completely out of control, although it's slowly coming under control because, you know, finally we have a government that takes it seriously there. But I... Uh, 
Uh, I think it may become more like the common cold or the flu or something like this, where it's just there in the population and you have to get annual vaccines and, uh, and it will just be there for a while. And the, you know, I mean, I hope not. I hope, I hope it, we get this here herd immunity that everybody's uh, talking about and that it does fade away, but I'm, I'm not so sure that's going to happen. And I think COVID may be the, you know, a sign for the future. I mean, maybe the 21st century will turn out to be the pandemic century. Mm. Well, I believe there was, and you may know this better than I, but there was a virus called like H2N2 or H2N3 in the States, I believe, or perhaps globally. And that Mm -hmm. led to over a million fatalities, if I'm not mistaken. And as far as I'm aware, there was no vaccine for that. It's just simply been brought into the fold of the flu season and it's just a new you know, right. virus thrown right. in the mix. So you could be right on that note that uh, this is just something that we're going to have to live with basically forever. Mm-hmm. It, it may be. And, and so, uh, you know, one, I mean, the good news is that biotechnology and innovation is up to the task. The fact that they've, develop this vaccine in record time Mm -hmm. but then there are all the issues with distribution and getting it out to people and and you know the inevitable idiocy of the populace and people reject vaccinations and all that you know we're really stupid monkeys in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know so i think I th- I think we'll just have to see how it plays out. I don't know. But the thing is, uh, you know, as pandemics go and as viruses go, as bad as it is, it could be much worse. You know, I mean, COVID is not like the flu or the cold. It, it's, it's much worse than that, but it's not as bad as what it could be. I mean, imagine something with the, you know, pathogenicity of, of COVID and the, and the effects like Ebola, you know, or something like that, then, you know, you would see the world order collapse very shortly, I think. I mean, look look how this has impacted everything economically and so on. So, uh, you know, it's a pretty grim picture, really. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely surprising. It's definitely surprising. I mean, I never, obviously no one really predicted this, although a pandemic was in some cases due to occur, but I want to kind of pivot to something I didn't get the chance to ask you last time. This is just kind of a personal curiosity of mine. It's kind of a two part question, but obviously you and your brother Terrence had the famous experiment at La Chirera. And I've heard you say previously that you almost can't explain what happened there because it's, you know, beyond language in some senses. And for those who are unaware, you and your brother Terence McKenna uh, went to the Amazon, I believe, and took significant regular doses of mushrooms, psychedelic mushrooms, and performed an experiment. And I'll probably not do it justice, but you attempted to harmonize your voices while under the influence of these psychedelics. Is that correct? All was finally in readiness. The living mushroom, the harmine brew, the harmine smoking mixture. After we each had taken a half a cup of the Yahe infusion, we settled down to wait. Dennis had been hearing the ESR tone that he deemed the sine qua non of what we were attempting for the past several days. After about 15 minutes, he announced that he could hear it more clearly and that it was gaining strength. He felt prepared to attempt the experiment at any time, he said. I tried to harmonize my voice with a tone or a sound that we could hear at very high doses of mushrooms inside the head, you know, and, and for some reason that, you know, this, the idea was of the experiment at La Chirera, I mean, there was a lot of stuff behind that, but the, the, the basic idea was that if we could harmonize to this tone with the voice, that we could do a, a kind of a psychic surgery on ourselves and cause the metabolizing molecules to intercalate into our DNA and, and put it into a superconducting state 
where it was uh, it was reading out the information in the base pairs of the DNA. Now that you know, as in the form of a standing wave, that would be essentially interrogatable uh, through telepathic, you know, telepathic. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, it was, uh, oh, you know, I mean, 50 years later. And it's interesting that this is 50 years after mm. Montero. And, and 50 years later, I have to say, most of it was was junk. You know, I mean, the reasoning was not solid, but the effects were interesting. I mean, even the uh, social and planetary effects. Uh, interesting that you should mention the experiment at La Terre right off, off the bat because we we're actually going to do a, uh, a retrospective on it um, on the 4th, uh, on March the 4th, which is the 50th anniversary. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing, uh, or I should say, Graham St. John. Do you know who he is? No. Nah. He's a journalist. He's Australian, actually. He oh, there wrote, you go. He wrote a book called the uh, the he called the, it's called Mystery School in Hyperspace, a cultural history of DMT, and uh, it's a great book, very interesting book, and and in the course of writing that book, we I got to know him. He's now working on a uh, biography of Terence, and me too, I guess, because I'm part of that story. And uh, he is going to interview me on the 4th of, uh, or we're going to pre-record an interview and then broadcast it on the, on uh, March the 4th uh, from the Academy website. So I'll, uh, you know, if you check the Academy, it'll be announced what, what is there. And you're probably already on our, uh, on our mailing list. So, so it, I, you know, I mean, the, 50th anniversary of the experiment at La Terra should not go unremarked, right? At, at least for me personally, it was a probably the craziest thing that's ever happened to me, hands down, you know, and I still live in in the memory of that event. So seems reasonable to uh acknowledge it and talk about it and 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 discuss, you know, where where did these ideas come from and where how does all this look 50 years downstream you know uh i mean a lot of people talk about uh, people talk about my brother and myself and sort of the mckenna brothers mythology and all that but uh, it's 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 kind of ironic to me that most of our lives have been lived post lecture you know, and a few things have happened post Lachera, but yet we're somehow anchored to that place and time, you know, and uh, uh, so, you know, we're going to revisit that and, and uh, reflect on whether any of it meant anything at the time or means anything now. <laughs> Okay. And I guess, obviously, if you're going to cover it, I won't go too much further into the experiment. But what I did want to ask is, you know, upon listening to recounts of the experiment and reading about it, I'm personally uncertain of, did something happen? Or was this, I believe Terence even described it as kind of a temporary schizophrenia. But he simultaneously, I think, was giving credibility to noticing phenomena that were shared between you both. So with the 50 years in hindsight, do you think something happened that was perhaps inexplicable or uh, supernatural? Or do you look back on it and think, you know, we were crazy, that was all kind of a drug-induced psychosis? I mean, how do you look back on that event? I don't, you know, 50 years later, I don't exactly know what to make of it, frankly. Uh, but I, uh, I, I think... I don't think, I mean, it, it was definitely a drug in, induced experiment, experience, although there was a lot going on there at, at points when we weren't on any drugs, you know, and we had taken plenty of drugs, but the, the real action at La Chirera happened 
you know, after we performed the experiment, we were no longer taking any drugs or very, very you know, very few cannabis perhaps, but maybe we'd succeeded in, 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 you know, creating some short circuit that looked like a psychotic reaction. I actually gave a talk uh, in 2017, which you may have seen called, uh, it was called the experiment at La Chirera. Uh Schizophrenic, uh, what was it? it was called experiment at La Chirera, psychotic break, uh, shamanic initiation or alien encounter, question mark. Mm. And uh, in the talk, I was leaning kind of, it was an alien encounter, you know, of, a, of some kind. I mean, we certainly had this strong impression that the whole thing was being orchest orchestrated by some being, which we called the teacher in either in another dimension, or we actually visualized that perhaps in orbit, you know, it was sending information down. But what the, the, the interesting thing about the experiment at Latura was that uh, it was a typical, if, if that term means anything, a typical UFO encounter, alien encounter in a certain way. Now, you know, it's kind of an oxymoron to say, a UFO encounter is typical, <laughs> mm. right? But it does these these encounters, as documented in the literature, they do have a a characteristic. Uh, there's a template essentially. They tend to go a certain way, and all of the elements for the experiment at La Chirera were, you know, you could just tick off the boxes in in terms of the way that it conforms to, you know, this, this sort of classical template for UFO encounters, you know, for one thing, uh, you know, it, it starts with a siren song. It starts with a, you know, an intuition, like something is calling, something is inducing us to make this trip, which we did, you know, we were utterly convinced that they were, we were on to some, momentous secret you know and and when we when we got to la Chirera, you know another element of it is that information is transmitted you know teachings are transmitted that was present you know whether the teachings meant anything hard to say but but the you know uh, the experiment was where we had the information download for the time wave uh, that that's really it, it was elaborated greatly over time, but the core of the idea came during that experiment, you know, or during that period. I don't call it an experiment. That's really a misnomer because an experiment, you know, an experiment has controls. <laughs> this this was classically out of control, you know. So it really should have been called the ritual of La Chirera, but it was. You know, it sounds cooler to say it was the experiment at La Chirera, you know. And then another aspect of uh, typical UFO encounters that this also had was this element of the absurd, you know. This, it, I mean, it, it's like a subtext that's saying, this is really not real. This is, this is you know, this this is some kind of an artificial reality that you've stumbled into, you know. And and in, in the case of, I mean, there were many absurd elements in the experiment at La Chirera, but probably the primary one, one of the one of the most interesting ones was in when Terrence had his UFO encounter, you know, when he actually saw the UFO and it materialized and it, it practically mowed him down you know now i wasn't there i mean i was there but i was cruising the cosmos at the time so i wasn't paying attention so this happened to him early one morning after he had not slept for like 14 days and this experience happened you know this ufo came but the interesting thing the absurd element was with the ufo when it got close to him was the classic George Adamski, 
debunked UFO with the with the photograph that was clearly made from like a surgical lamp or a Hoover vacuum cleaner, <laughs> you know, and and the UFO looked exactly like that. And uh, so, you know, that's I, I mean, I think that's typical of these kinds of events. It's a cognitive dissonance, you know, how can it be real if this, you know, if the UFO looks like this, this debunked UF, UF, you know, fake UFO photograph with this crackpot, George Adamski, you know, so I think that's typical of these events, you know, in, in the sense that it's, it, the person, the bounds, the boundaries of reality in a certain way, and certain things happen that at the time, it just seems natural in a certain way, you know, that you don't question it when it's happening. Afterwards, you look back and you say, what the fuck was going on? <laughs> you know, how could this be? And, and the experiment of had all those elements to it. You know, and and the other thing is the the, you know, not only was was knowledge transmitted, you know, uh, a, a, a big download about not only the time wave but also wildly radical ideas about drug action. You know, drug uh, because at the time, 1971, nobody even knew what a receptor looked like. You know, the state. Uh, you know, of our uh, suppositions. And it wasn't, you know, that that the molecules were binding to DNA at some point. Uh, another aspect of the experiment that, um, you know, another one of these typical elements was that not only is information transmitted, but gifts, gifts are given, you know, and uh, you receive often in a, you know, you're given a book or you're given some scrolls or something as in the Mormon religion, which I feel, which I also feel is kind of a, based on a UFO encounter or Maria Sabena, the mushroom curandera would talk about how she was shown a book, you know, and when she goes into her trance, she reads from the book. Well, we didn't get a book, but we got a physical gift, which didn't break any any physic any laws. You know, it, it it was not a supernatural thing, but but it had the most impact, and that was we brought spores back from the Amazon, and then we figured out how to grow those things, and that gave us a very simple technology that we could share with the world, which we did. And now I think you're seeing the, uh, you know, the consequences of that. I mean, that actually did have uh, a, an impact on society. The fact that it, that mushrooms became much more common, much more easily accessed after that, because anybody with a little patience could figure out to grow how to grow them. So, you know, if people say, well, what, what? You know, uh, I, I guess when we went into the experiment, we were suffering or suffering from enjoying. I don't know what the right word is. Some some fairly delusional suppositions, you know, and and we were convinced that it was going to change everything. You know, if, if we succeeded with this, and and it would change us forever. And both of those things were true, but not in the way that we thought they were going to be true. You know, they were true in the sense that mushrooms have become a catalyst, I think, for uh, the next phase. Everyone is excited now about mushrooms. They're they're taking over. They've they've entered medicine. Everyone wants to. You know, many companies are starting up. So, and this is a this is a consequence of them having been around for so long. I mean, they've basically been accessible to anyone since the mid seventies and one of the more common psychedelics available. And so, so in that, in that sense, it had consequences.
Right. And then something I wanted to ask you kind of touching upon that question of like what you're actually perceiving and the legitimacy of that or the reality of that. Uh, I'm sure you've read and probably met Rick Strassman in his book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. I believe you're even in the documentary. And yes, I am. For those who don't know what the book is, effectively DMT is administered in, I guess, a clinical setting to a series of individuals who are then asked to report what they see. And what's interesting to me and perhaps everyone who reads the book or watches the documentary is the recurrent, I guess, motifs that present themselves. So two Mm -hmm. just off the top of my head are like the elves and obviously your brother and you both talk about the elves and then the kind of praying mantis insectoid type uh, Mm -hmm. vision. Mm -hmm. And what I find so fascinating about that is the fact that it is recurrent across several groups of people um, without them having communicated to one another. Do you think that, you know, elves and mantises, are these just kind of archetypal fears of humans or is this, is there something that's being tapped into when let's say DMT is administered? What, what do you think that, that is? That's the $64,000 question right there. You know, is it a, another dimension, you know, which is what took us to La Chirera at the time. I mean, that we were convinced we were, we were, not coming at this from a, a typical direction of, of shamanism or spiritual, uh, you know, spiritual development. It wasn't really about that for us. We were, we were steeped in Jungian psychology for one thing, obviously, uh, Merceliade's work for another, but, you know, we were, uh, we were science fiction nuts, you know, and we were deeply immersed in science fiction and we were convinced that uh, it was a portal to some kind of an other dimension. And, you know, the themes of aliens was, uh, of, and the potential that of alien contact was uh, very much part of the whole rationale, if there, if you want to put it that way, for going to La Chirera, for embarking on this wild, crazy adventure, you know. So, but the question is, you know, the mantis, the the elves. I don't get so much elves, by the way. I mean, I've I've had the experience. It's not. Uh, it's not invariable part of the experience. Uh, uh, I just think it's impossible to say, you know, I mean, I think that these are archetypes and you come to the, you know, the, the, the crux of the question is, uh, is it, is it another place that DMT or whatever we mean by place, another dimension, presumably that, DMT lets us penetrate for a, a short time and look around. It certainly has that feeling about it, or is it entirely within ourselves? You know, some some reality that we construct and then and then and proceed to inhabit for a period of time. I think it's very difficult to know. You know, because you're what one thing psychedelics do is they put you in a place where these these uh, you know these dualisms don't really apply right and and there's there's the self and the other there's you know you usually have a sense of being separated from uh, the reality that we perceive but psychedelics the insights of psychedelics tell us that that's really an illusion you know, I mean, even our existence with an ego separate from everything else is kind of an illusion that we construct for our convenience. So if you come to a point where you're trying to say, well, uh, this is real and that is not, it gets it gets awkward, you know, to say. I mean, because I say, you know, in some sense, all we have is experience, you know, experience, our experience of the present moment is really what's real for us at any one time. So if you get to a conversation about what is real, well, anything you experience is real, you know, 
experience if you experience it it's real in that you experience it but then does it correspond to something outside the self or inside the self it's very hard to say you know because the 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 brain is a machine for constructing this artificial reality you know which i i sometimes call the reality hallucination uh and in neuroscience now, they're calling it the, the default mode network, which is another way to, to look at it. But this is, this is what the brain does. It's a confabulator. It, it constructs this uh, sort of reflection of reality that's a model of reality that has been, uh, I won't say dumbed down, but perhaps, have, perhaps flattened in some ways from from whatever the reality is out there, which is in, inherently and by definition unknowable. So we're left to deal with a model of reality. And that's the reality hallucination. That's the world that we inhabit, you know, most of the time, except that you can take a psychedelic and probably approach this other ways as well, but you can take a psychedelic, you can temporarily disable that default mode function and you can you can step out of your customary reference frame and i think that's one of the main virtues one of the main features of psychedelics is it lets you see that you can step out of this reference frame temporarily and that's important both for uh, you know exploration of consciousness but also the therapeutic properties of of psychedelics because you can you can get a distance on these things and look at your existential situation in a in a way that you normally can't because you're you're trapped in the default mode network <clears throat> so you can look at things in a way that uh, you never have before and perhaps understand better what your issues are whether they be ptsd or depression or uh you know addiction or whatever it helps to be able to understand from kind of without from a perspective outside your normal reference frame if that makes any sense no no it definitely does and it kind of leads into my next question which was that i'm not sure if you would have seen this but our drug regulator here in Australia, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, they recently rejected an application which sought to reschedule two prohibited drugs, which is MDMA and psilocybin. And so my question to you was going to be, you know, you mentioned the kind of therapeutic applications of psychedelics like PTSD or depression and things of that nature. Do you think we will one day see psychedelics brought into the mainstream medicine and do you think this is possible do you think yes, it's something I, that'll be missed in doing so no i i think it's already happening i i think they will be drop, brought into mainstream medicine i saw the the notice that uh, the australian health authorities had rejected these applications it's very foolish mm -hmm. you know and i i think it will change uh, the rest of the world is not responding that way. You know, uh, as I understand it, Australia has always had, f for a long time, their drug laws have been very draconian. Uh, mm. But, you know, there's an abundance of scientific evidence and well-controlled clinical studies showing that these things can be safely used and they are effective under the right circumstances. So I think it's a temporary glitch in Australia. I hope so. The rest of the world is more accepting of it. You know, it is beginning to be, you know, both psilocybin and MDMA are now on a fast track to approval uh, in both the US and Canada for certain types of disorders. Uh, so, uh, I, I think that's going to continue. Now, the question is, how do you do it? Because, mm. because psychedelic therapy model does not fit very well into the, the current biomedical, uh, the, the current biomedical establishment, because, uh, you know, 
it, it, what I, I guess, I guess the, the main thing is that you cannot use these things in a medical system and a medical uh, clinical setting without intense therapeutic support, you know, so, and that hasn't been the model, you know, we're so far away from the take two and call me in the morning model with psychedelics. <laughs> That doesn't work, you know. That may work for some of the psychopharmaceuticals that are that are used, like antidepressants, but they're they're barely effective. If you're going to use psychedelics for therapy, this kind of therapy, you completely have to upend the current approach to psychiatry and mental health care. You have to you have to shift from the model of managing these these conditions through through uh you know pharmacotherapy through basically uh medicines that they don't let you get to the root of the problem but they can help you manage the problem by basically papering it over by by their band-aids is what they are psychedelics actually can help people reach get insights as to the causes of their existential situation and thereby resolve them. But it does not happen on its own. It requires preparation to have the experience. It, it requires intense therapeutic support during the experience and after the experience. So, so the, from the economic point of view, the, the focus has to change to the therapist, you know, the, the drug becomes less important in terms of the revenues. That's why I think uh, some of these startup companies that want to, uh, you know, bring psychedelics into mainstream medicine, some of, some of them have the model that, well, they'll just make the medicines and sell the medicines. And that may work, but most companies, if they want to use it therapeutically, the medicines are less important than the support services that they bring to it. You know, that's where the money is to be made, if there is money to be made. And I'm not convinced that, you know, even though you know how a lot of investment, a lot of investors, there's a lot of venture capital going into this sector right now. You know, but that's the way venture capital is. It seeks the next big thing, uh, and everybody wants to get on board. Uh, I think it remains to be seen whether this is, in fact, the next big thing. Uh, and if it is, great. I think it has. I think it has great potential to help a lot of people. Uh, I think there is. Uh, you know, there are there. It's also problematic in certain ways because it's uh, you know it's not just another drug. These these psychedelic medicines have such a long history of association with our species, and so there are you know there are cultural issues and and you know indigenous issues and all that. We're doing what has always been done, which is we're sort of appropriating indigenous knowledge and and directing it to our own use, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's important that we recognize where that's coming from. And because, you know, there have been, psychedelics have been safely used uh, in the context of shamanism for many thousands of years before there was ever an FDA to tell us that we couldn't do that, you know. So we need to learn from those traditions and acknowledge them and also, to the extent possible, you know, uh, implement some kind of reciprocity. The indigenous people have been stewards of this knowledge for so long. Uh, they should They should have a place at the table. Mm. And you, you previously, when you were on this podcast, previously you mentioned that it would be the, you know, in, I guess, uh, indigenous context, it would be the doctor, so to speak, who would be taking the drug and they would impart the wisdom onto the patient. And you yourself obviously have gone to many ayahuasca retreats in the Amazon, I believe hosted several. 
Yeah. Do you find that that context of doing it in a more traditional indigenous setting elicits a very different result? Do you find that perhaps the clinical westernized uh, use of psychedelics is going to actually result very differently than how it's been traditionally used? Well, yes, I I do. I think uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, you know uh, I I mean the the traditional use of ayahuasca as we discussed before when it was when it was really traditional before there was an ayahuasca tourism industry that these practitioners had to cater to. It was often the case that the shaman would would take the medicine, and the people would come, and and the medicine, the ayahuasca was essentially a diagnostic tool for the shaman. He would, he or she would get the the message in this altered state what to do to help help the patient, whatever treatments might be suggested. Rarely they would give it to the patients, but the rule was. You know, the custom was that it was something that it was it was like the, the shamanic X-ray machine or the shamanic, you know, CT scanner. He could take it and then get insights as to what the person's the person's problem were and what to do to fix it, which might involve other plants or might involve different behavioral therapies and, and that sort of thing. Uh and that that's not really happening in the clinical setting. The way it's the way it's used in the clinical setting is quite different. And what I think is that as uh, as the use of psychedelics in the context of medicine matures and we learn more how to use it, I think that the clinical uses of psychedelics is going to start to resemble. The, the traditional uses, the shamanic uses. And in fact, there may be a migration together of these things. Again, this is borrowing from or applying the knowledge that indigenous people have had about how to use these things for, for thousands of years. So it's important to listen to that and, uh, and apply those principles if possible. So I think I, I think that you know the psychedelic medicine of the future is not going to look like shamanism. It's not going to look like psychiatry, clinical psychiatry. It will look like a hybrid a combination of these things, which is a good thing. You know, I mean, I think I think that uh, psychotherapy has a lot to bring to the table, and it's not incompatible with uh, with uh, traditional shamanic knowledge either. You know, so we have to create a new paradigm, a new synthesis of that combines these practices in a way that is more powerful than than either one by itself. Mm. Yeah, I would definitely agree. And obviously, you probably more than most people have your finger on the pulse of of the psychedelic industry and and community. I guess is a better word. I wanted to ask you what your favorite or, you know, most interesting piece of, let's say, uh, a study, for example. What is the most interesting thing that you've come to learn about psychedelics in your experience? The most interesting thing? Mm, which is a broad question, I know, but... Yeah, it's very hard to pick out any, any one thing that I can, that I can point to. Uh, yeah, you know, um, ayahuasca and mushroom have both been my primary teachers. Probably, ayahuasca somewhat more in the last, uh, you know, in the last few years. But but now I'm rediscovering mushrooms as well. I think that. I think if there are insights to be gained from these experiences that stick, I think one of them is we have to recognize the limitations of our knowledge, you know, and that psychedelics really bring that into focus, you know, a, a recognition that our knowledge of 
how things are, how the world is is arranged and how we experience it. We have only a tiny piece of that, you know, and, uh, uh, and science even more so. Science is even more restrictive. Science is not the necessarily the, the most, uh, you know, I mean, it's not necessarily the most advanced way of gaining knowledge. You know, it's very useful in its approaches because it enables you to ask questions of nature that you might get verifiable answers back from. But that said, we have to understand that, you know, science really only understands a small slice of reality. You know, and there's a lot going on that it doesn't really address. That doesn't mean those things aren't real. So I guess uh, that's one of the main insights is recognizing that, you know, there's a whole lot more going on than we think is going on in the ordinary reality or uh, in, in psych psychedelic states can, can temporarily open a window onto this area of phenomena. And uh, you know, we, can, we can learn from that. We can gain insights into it. Uh, and eventually we may come to understand it. And I'm, I'm not one of these people that says, you know, science cannot answer all the questions so it's useless let's just toss it out i don't think so i think it has a lot to uh, you know it's very useful because essentially it's a way to ask very specific questions of nature and get answers back that make sense but that said any system of knowledge is inherently has its limits so that's the other thing that comes out of taking psychedelics, I think, is a certain, uh, you know, if you're listening to these medicines, if you're really uh, paying attention, I think one thing you come away with is perhaps uh, a little bit more humility, uh, you know, we uh, and uh, willingness to say, yeah, there are actually part, you know, we don't have it all figured out, basically. You know, we don't really know what's going on, and that's okay. I mean, it's not necessarily our mission to completely answer all the ultimate questions. You know, um, there may not even be ultimate answers, but it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's not really our job to come up with some final uh model of reality or model of the universe that answers all the questions. <clears throat> I think the more important thing is to re recognize that there are many questions, <clears throat> most of which will probably not be answered, at least in our lifetime. And some people would say, well, my God, we'll never figure it out. You know, we'll never figure it out. Well, who puts you there to, to is that why we're here to try to figure it out? Hmm. Maybe so, you know, or maybe not. Maybe we're just here. I mean, I think what works for me is the, or has worked up to now, is the idea that just thinking about crazy ideas, interesting ideas, and that sort of thing are basically fun. You know, they don't have to be the final answers but we can still enjoy speculation and, and, you know, in fits and starts, we expand the sphere of, of understanding, you know, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand our place, you know, both as individuals and as a species and as a planet sort of in the overall scheme of things. So I think that psychedelics are, tremendous tools for insight for that. Uh, and, you know, there is no one, one thing. It's, it's, it's more of a worldview that you come to, uh, uh, that you come to. And, and in that worldview is the recognition that all knowledge is inherently incomplete. I mean, all by definition, there are limitations to knowledge. So that's one thing. People might say, well, that's very depressing, but I, I don't feel that way. I feel like that means there's a whole lot left to learn, 
you know, a whole lot more for us to appreciate. And that's a good thing. That's an evolution toward, uh, you know, a more conscious state. So I, I think that these things are kind of cognitive catalysts in that way toward uh, their co-evolutionary catalysts toward uh, evolution of consciousness. And uh, why does nature give us these gifts? I don't know. Maybe it's just a, it's just an accident of the way things are, the way life is. Uh, you know, I, I, well, I guess, I guess I'll end it there. <laughs> I'm kind of getting incoherent here, but yeah, I think you see where my drift is going. No, no, I definitely see. And uh, one point that I love that you made was that, you know, ultimately, especially in our lifetime, it's highly unlikely we're going to have all the answers to the universe and to existence. But underlying it all is that it's fun to hypothesize. It's fun to have conjecture. And it's it's enjoyable to be part of that experience, um, which I think people lose. And as you mentioned, people get depressed because we don't know everything. And, you know, frankly, we we know so little that it's almost exciting. Or I should... I believe people should perceive it that way. That, yeah, uh, you and I are on the same page that way. I mean, it, it's like it's like the, the fact that we know so li- it is exciting because it means there's so much left to learn. Mm. You know, and if you like to learn, then you know you're never going to run out of questions to ask. I don't think that uh, it's. I think the people get depressed because they feel like they're not going to arrive at the ultimate answers are really doing themselves a disservice because number one, there may not be ultimate answers. You know, there's a lot of knowledge, a lot of things to be discovered. And number two, even if you never reach that place, nobody reaches that place. It's, it's ever incomplete. So, you know, it's, it's better to be, uh, you know, to take joy in a certain way in the fact that things are indeterminate, you know, because once you, you know, it's a fluid situation, it means essentially anything could happen, you know, and that's, that's kind of exciting. So I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think as, as individuals or as a, a species, we should set ourselves the goal of understanding complete understanding of what reality is and what our place in it is you know that doesn't mean that we can uh can't have fun trying we can think about these things but we're not going to have any final answers Mm. and i'm okay with that you know yeah as am i and i think you know to quote you again that we are effectively just stupid monkeys and the fact that you and i are able to have this conversation on opposite ends of the globe is a feat in itself and that's something we should enjoy instead of looking to the next thing so desperately but uh dennis i'm obviously conscious of your time so i want to ask you and i asked you this previously but for those who are just tuning in for the first time you run the mckenna academy can you tell us a little bit about that and what you seek to achieve Okay, well, the yeah, the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy. Uh, it's a, it's a, um, you know, I can I can put the uh, the URL in here. You probably have already, but yeah. Uh, and I will put the URL in the link of this video, um, so yeah, people can access it quite easily. It, it's a nonprofit that I started when I moved to Canada uh, and uh, you know uh, it's, it's mission is basically educational and uh, you know, at at heart, I'm a teacher, you know, that's what I like to do. That's what I've uh, you know, what I've, what has been most gratifying is to interact with other brilliant people like yourself and, and, you know, be amazed together. And, you know, wisdom begins in wonder, right? As Socrates said. So the McKenna Academy, I guess that's a core principle. We want it to be a place (coughs) for education and learning in natural philosophy. And natural philosophy is what science 
grew out of. Natural philosophy was the precursor to science, but then science became very rigid and reductionist. And uh, natural philosophy is not necessarily that. And so, uh, you know, the the uh, originally the idea of the McKenna Academy is that it would be a the first psychedelic university in 1600 years since the the mystery schools of uh, at Eleusis were sacked and burned by the Goths in 396 AD. We want to revive that spirit in the McKenna Academy of being a psychedelically based university where sometimes I say not all the faculty are necessarily human. You know, and a place for discourse and exchange of ideas. Uh, you know, the, the original concept was that we would do most of this stuff in physical venues in South America or whatever. I've been, as you know, I've been organizing ayahuasca retreats there for quite a while. I wanted to continue with that and do conferences and so on. And then COVID came along and pretty much put the put the squash on that for now. So that's why we're trying to form a, a pretty strong uh, uh, online presence. And like everybody else, we're virtually we're we're shifting into the virtual because those are the options that are open to us. So uh, if you look at the academy, we you can look at the events page and. And the resources page, the events page is where we're putting up and coming events, but also past events. And so people can access most of that stuff off the web page. And, uh, you know, our, our direction has had to change somewhat uh, since, since, you know, we're not able to do any traveling and so on. I hope that that is a temporary situation. Uh, and I am eager to get back into the field and and do some of these things down in South America. But right now, this is what what we have to work with, and, and it's okay. You know, we're doing we're doing all right. We did a uh, we did a uh, uh, several week long tribute to Terence last year about this time to commemorate his death in uh, in. You know, the 20th anniversary of his death, you may have seen some of those events. Uh, and we did a, a, symbi a sim two-day symposium on uh, symbiosis, which was also kind of interesting. And as we go along and, and produce these virtual events, we're learning more about how to do it correctly you know how to do it right i think a lot of people are exploring this space and i think what we're finding out at least from our point of view is that two or three day conferences online don't work for most people because you know because of covid we're all on zoom hours every week you know mm. and they, these things come up all the time and like, oh my god not another virtual symposium that mm. i have to be at you know so i'm i'm not a good sport in that sense <laughs> <laughs> well uh dennis thank you so much for joining me again it was a pleasure talking to you as always um as I mentioned, people can find you at McKenna.academy. I'll put a link in the description to the video. Uh, any final comments before we go, Dennis? No, uh, just uh, just keep your powder dry, and let's hope that uh, let's hope that the Australian regulatory people wake up, you know, uh, and and change change the framework, and uh, let me know when this is posted and. Uh, I'll make sure we get it on our social media as well. And uh, no, I just think the, you know, here, here, here is where we are, you know, and, and I guess like every, every historical juncture, there are things to be happy about and, and amazed and things to be very dismayed about, you know, and this is, this is typical historical era like dickens said it was the best of times and the worst of times mm. all of that is happening now it's just it's happening faster than any of us can keep up i guess that's 
that's what leaves us a bit exhausted sometimes. But what can we do? We just uh, we just keep on keeping on, and we have to have faith that it's going somewhere that uh, is meaningful. Yeah, we just got to ride the wave. Well, thank you, Dennis. Uh, lovely talking to you, and I'll uh, speak to you soon. All right. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks, Dennis. 